Today I'm preaching on laziness. Laziness. Now in the Bible, uh, we don't uh, have the word laziness. And laziness is a sin. Uh, the Bible uses the word slothful, you know, slothfulness, the sluggard. Uh, that's what the, how the Bible describes laziness. And we're going to look at a lot of... The Bible has a lot to say about laziness. Um, if you haven't ever read through Proverbs, uh, you'll see it. So we, we'll come back to Proverbs 26. But like I said, the, la- the word laziness is not found in the Bible. But the Bible has a lot to say about laziness. And if you've read through Proverbs, it's always a good kick in the pants if you're feeling lazy. <laughs> so let's get into it. So first of all, what I want to say is, when it comes to serving the Lord, we don't want to be lazy. We don't want to be a slothful sluggard, right? And it's just funny how the Bible uses these terms, even the, the words themselves feel lazy, you know, like a sluggard just moving slowly across uh, uh, the, the pavement, you know, leaving, I guess, mess at the same time. <laughs> My wife hates slugs, <laughs> by the way. I didn't realize she hates them <laughs> so much, but she hates slugs. When she sees slugs in the garden, it's funny that she'll, she'll kill a cockroach. Like, I hate cockroaches, but like when it comes to slugs, that's when I can be there. I'll get rid of the slugs and the, and the snails. So serving the Lord. We don't want to be lazy serving the Lord, lazy in our service. Look at what the Bible says in Hebrews 6. And we desire that every one of you do show, so that, that word's pronounced show, it's just an old spelling, do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful. See, God doesn't want you to be lazy, right? But followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So you want to be, see, you see here, you don't want to be lazy. You want to follow the example of people that are not lazy. But unfortunately, sometimes in church, people follow the example of people that are lazy. How do we do that? How do we follow the example of people that are lazy? Oh, you know, well, nobody else is doing this. I don't have to do it either. Nobody else is going soul winning. Oh, maybe it's all right if I don't go either. So you see how you're following the example of people that are lazy in church rather than following the example of people that are working hard in church. So, you see, you don't want to be slothful in service. You don't want to think, oh, you know, well, that my friend or this person doesn't go to church every week. It's all right for me to not go to church every week. So you see how you're following the wrong example. You want to follow the example of those who, through faith and patience, inherit the promises. You want to follow those that are doing the right thing. Right? Romans 12, verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. What does that mean? It's not fake. Abhor that which is evil. Hate that which is evil. That's what abhor means. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. Verse 11. Not slothful in business. So you see how laziness being lazy is a sin not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So you see here, we're going to talk as well, because obviously laziness can apply to things outside of church as well, and we'll talk about that too. But laziness can also apply to your ministry. Right? What do you mean by your ministry? Like what you're doing for God. Everybody should have a ministry. Say, Victor, well, I, you know, I don't have a ministry. I, your ministry is what you're doing for God. It doesn't have to be some official title or official thing. It's just what you are doing for God in your life. You as an ambassador of Jesus Christ, that's your ministry for the Lord. Now, sometimes that becomes an official ministry in a church or in an organization. But everybody needs to be doing something for God. Or you say, what, I'm not doing anything for God in my life. Well, then you've got to get something to do for God in your life. Right? If you're just busy, just working, doing stuff, and just doing stuff for yourself, doing stuff for others... Hey, those things are good as well, but you need to have something you're doing for God as well. And what do I mean by that? Something that furthers the kingdom, furthers the kingdom, teaches more people about the Bible, gets people saved, teaches people about Jesus. That's our ministry. That's the main goal of Christianity is how do we spread the word, right? So are we doing something that's helping to spread the word? That's what your ministry is. So we don't want to be lazy, obviously, in our personal and professional life, We also don't want to be lazy when it comes to (coughs) our ministry for the Lord, serving the Lord. Not slothful in business, 
fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So you can see what is the opposite of being lazy. It's being passionate. It's being fervent. It's being, you know, hardworking. Diligence is the opposite of being lazy. Right? So some people are lazy coming to church. Right? You wake up Sunday morning, oh, I, just want to, I want to sleep in. Or, you know, I have to go every week. You know, and yes, you should go every week, right? Because it's every week and you get a reminder of why you're living in this world. Because you forget sometimes that you live throughout your week, what your purpose is here. You get caught up with work, you get caught up with all the stuff you've got to do, and then you just get caught up with that's like the life, like my rat race. But no, you come to church and you're reminded, wait a second, no, my life isn't just about these temporary things. My life is about things of eternity. My life is about winning souls. My life, I've got to live my life for eternity, not just for the temporary. And a weekly reminder is a good reminder. So sometimes people are lazy coming to church. You know, lazy just driving too far or whatnot. So you don't want to be lazy to go to church. You, want to be, you don't want to be lazy in soul winning. You know, oftentimes I take people soul winning. Sometimes it's, it starts off with fear. right? And they're worried. Oh, I don't know, you know what people are going to say at the door and everything like that. Just say, just... I don't say anything, just come along, just, just listen. And you know, what always happens after the first time people go soul winning, they realize, oh, this is not so bad. You know, people, people are not that scary. You know, people are generally polite. You, know, you go and you get to talk to somebody, and you know, if they don't want to talk, they don't want to talk. It's not that big a deal. And you know what, inevitably, the reason why people don't go, it's because of laziness. Right? Because soul winning just takes work. It just takes, takes some commitment. Takes, you've got to actually go out there and do it. So generally, people that go, after the first one or two times, they realize it's not nothing to be scared of. So fear may stop you from going the first time. But really, what stops people from continuing to serve the Lord, to continue to preach the gospel, is just laziness, right? They just don't commit the time every week to go and talk to people about the gospel. So we don't want to be lazy in our soul. We don't want to be lazy in our Bible reading. Maybe you want to read the Bible throughout the year. You don't have to read it. You don't have to read it for 10 to 15 minutes a day. If you read it for 10 to 15 minutes a day, you'll read through the Bible once a year, right? And obviously, if you read it faster or slower, if you read faster than that, you could you could read through it more. But you know, sometimes we're lazy in our Bible reading. You know, we have all the time to read everything else, but we don't read our Bible. Sometimes we're lazy in prayer, and we, our mind is always consumed with so many things. We don't take the time to just pray for others. Pray for others, think of others, pray to God. You know, we want to pray without ceasing. But we can be lazy. You see how we can be lazy in our spiritual life. We just don't take the time, we're not diligent making sure we get things done for the Lord. Colossians 3. So not only we don't want to be lazy when it comes to our ministry, we don't want to be lazy just in our professional and personal life as well. Colossians 3, servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleases. What is this saying here? It's like you're not just doing stuff because people are watching you. See, this is why lazy people always have to be supervised. They always need somebody telling them what to do because they don't have the ethic to just do it themselves, right? And just work hard without being watched. And this is what the Bible's saying here. So the Bible's even giving us instruction here on how we ought to be as a worker, as an employee, right? We don't want to just serve just because the boss is watching, right? We're not just serving with eye service as men pleases. Look, but in singleness of heart, fearing God, and whatsoever you do, look at this, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. So we tend to separate our secular work with our ministry, right? But this verse brings it back together. And he says, you know what? Working hard at your work is actually a spiritual thing. God expects you to work for your boss like you would work for Jesus Christ. And obviously there's a hierarchy of authority. So obviously if your boss asks you to do something sinful, right, against God's word, then that's where you disobey. But in terms of your job, on the job where you should be working hard, the Bible's saying the way you ought to work at your work is the same way we ought to serve God. That's why when you get to work, you work hard like you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ. So even though it's secular work, right? You say it's, this is not spiritual. It is spiritual in a sense because your attitude and your work ethic at work is a reflection of how obedient you are to God's word. 
right? So whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. You say, my Victor, I just work so hard at work and I never get recognized. I'm not getting paid what I'm worth. I'm always underpaying me. I've had wages skipped on me. Well, you can take solace in the fact that if your boss shortchanges you, you know who's going to pay you back in heavenly rewards? The Lord Jesus Christ. Because ultimately, you're serving Him. And if you work as though you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ, even if you don't get paid what you're worth in this world, God will see to it that it'll be made up for all eternity. So with that sort of mindset, we can go to work and not murmur and complain against the boss like a lot of people do. A lot of Christians do that too. You go to work and you complain and you murmur. Just get, just get your hand to the plow and just work. Right? And you know what? Normally what happens when people just get, put their hand to the plow and they work hard, ultimately bosses <laughs> recognize that and you get promoted anyway. Right? So even if you had the right mindset, it will probably do you better than complaining and trying to skimp at work and all that sort of stuff. Verse 25, And he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of person. So again, it works both ways, doesn't it? So even though this first point, we're talking about serving the Lord, right? We talk about our ministry and, and working in, in soul winning at a church and just in prayer and all the things we do in the Christian life. Don't think that your secular work is any less spiritual in the sense that you need to be doing that work like you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ as well, right? So we don't want to be lazy when it comes to serving the Lord, both in spiritual things as well as non-spiritual things because it all rolls up into obeying the Lord. Now we're going to go through some Proverbs. There's a lot of different Proverbs and I just want to show you God's thoughts on laziness. And some of these are quite humorous if you haven't read these before. <clears throat> we're going to go through Proverbs. Proverbs on slothfulness or laziness. Now look at, look at how Proverbs 1 starts. If you've never read the book of Proverbs, I suggest you do. There's so many great things in there. I mean, even though we read through just one chapter today, you can see there's a lot of wisdom in the Proverbs. These are just, Proverbs are just wise sayings, and a lot of them were written by King Solomon. Um, so, you know, like the wisest man that ever lived, you know, wrote down a lot of the wisdom through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost for us. So we can get a lot of practical wisdom through the Proverbs, and that's just really great, you know, just sometimes, you, you know, you, you hear like some, like, sermon or some seminar, you know, from the business world, and then you realize, hey, these are principles that the Bible's teaching, you know, as well, so it's just like, you know, sometimes God's wisdom aligns with the wisdom of the world, and sometimes you have the wisdom of the world that doesn't align, so that's why you don't want to just take wisdom of the world and just run with it, just because people are successful, we want to take the wisdom of the world, make sure, you know, it lines up with the wisdom of God, right? And that's what we take. You know, you take the meat and spit out the bones. Proverbs 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. <coughs> <coughs> to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment and equity. See, this is what knowing the Proverbs will help you to do. Know wisdom, instruction, understand, justice, see what's fair, how to judge right, equity, to make things equal, to give subtlety to the simple. Right? So it's like how a simple person can be a bit more wise about how they do things. To the young man, knowledge and discretion. Right? Why do I underline young man there? Because often young men are very lazy. Right? knowledge and discretion, right? A wise man will hear and will increase learning and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. Notice here, it's like wise people in the world never stop learning. Right? Never get to that point where you just think you know it all. You know, sometimes you talk to older people. Oh yeah, I... I you know, I read the Bible like 30 years ago or whatever. They, they know it all. You know, so you don't want to have this attitude as an older person. You know, we want to have the attitude as we grow older that we're always learning. You know, we're always learning. There's always things to learn. This is what the Bible says here. A wise man will hear, right? They will listen. They will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. So it's not that when somebody knows everything, they no longer need to get other people's opinion. It's saying, actually, the more you learn, the more you realize it's wise to get opinions from others. It's wise to listen. It's wise to continue to learn because you don't know it all. 
right? Verse 6, to understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Right? So people that do not take heed to the proverbs and the wise sayings of God, the Bible calls them a fool. Right? They don't fear the Lord enough to start learning the ways of the Lord. All right, so that's why if you've never read through Proverbs, Proverbs has a lot to say about laziness. Let's look at some of them. So we'll start at Proverbs 26. This is what we read in the chapter. Look at what it says here. As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? What does that mean? A man that's wise in his own mind, not humble enough to realize he doesn't know everything but a man wise in his own conceit. He thinks of himself more than he ought, right? There is more hope of a fool than of him. So interesting that the Bible has a lot to say about fools. I mean, it starts off with like, I mean, the fool, it's like going back, it's being silly. It's going back to his silliness, right? His folly. But he's saying there, a man who is wise in his own conceit, there is more hope in a fool than the person who thinks he knows everything, right? The person who's wise in his own conceit, right? Thinks more highly of himself than he ought. We're going to come back to that. It's interesting what the verse says later. Now we get into the lazy man. The slothful man say it. There is a lion in the way. A lion is in the streets. So what do you get from this verse? Is a lazy person always making excuses, right? You want to get him to go outside. Oh, but there might be a lion outside. There's just these crazy, silly excuses. I might be killed outside by a lion. This is what lazy people do, right? Lazy people just make excuses all the time. For why they can't do things. Why they can't do this. And this is what a slothful man does. Like we say here, there's a lion in the way. A lion is in the street. Verse 14. As the door turneth upon his, in, his hinges, so doth the slothful upon his bed. It's like, oh, it's me. <laughs> I'm sure my wife has saw me turning on my bed. as <laughs> The hinge door. Uh, enough times in my life. As the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful upon his bed. The lazy people, they just always want to sleep. Just sleep more, five minutes more. The funny thing is, the more you sleep, the more tired you get. Right? So that's what the slothful person does. He doesn't want to get up. It's just turning and tossing in his bed. The slothful hideth his hand in his bosom. So what do you think hiding your hand in your bosom is, right? You kind of think your bosom is kind of like this area. You think, I hide my, hide my hand in my bosom? This is what I picture when I see hideth his hand in his bosom. Right? The stubbornness of a lazy person. I just will not do it. It grieveth him to bring it again to his mouth. Another proverb says it's just like so hard for the sluggard to even like feed himself. Just like, just so lazy. He's not even willing to do the most simple of things like bring his hand to his mouth, right? They grieve with him to bring it again to his mouth. And it's talking about his hand, and we know because another proverb that I don't have in the notes, but that's what it's talking about. Just the stubbornness of somebody that's lazy or doesn't want to do hard work and make excuses, and they're stubborn. Look at it in verse 16. The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit and seven men that can render a reason. So this is interesting that the Bible says earlier on, seest thou a wise man, a man wise, not a wise man, a man wise in his own conceit. There is more hope of a fool than of him. And then the Bible says later on, the sluggard, the lazy person, is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. So in the lazy person's mind, they can justify their laziness, right? They can come up with all excuses and all reasons why they don't do it. They think they've got it all figured out, but they're just being lazy <laughs> in the end. Right? All the excuses they come up with. And the Bible says there's more hope for a fool than of the lazy person. Now, why is that? Because I think, because at least the fool does something, right? It's like the fool may going and returning again to his folly, but you would think if the fool just keeps trying, maybe he'll just get wiser just from doing, right? But the lazy person will not even do. So they can't even learn from the doing. Right? That's why there's more hope of a fool than of 
the man wise in his own conceit, like the slugger. Proverbs 20, verse 4. <laughs> Proverbs 20, verse 4. It says here, The sluggard will not plough by reason of the cold. Therefore shall he beg and harvest and have nothing. Like I said, there's always an excuse for the sluggard to not work. Right? It's like with soul winning. People always say, oh, it's too cold to go soul winning. It's too hot to go soul winning. It's too wet to go soul winning. They're like the Goldilocks Christian, where it just has to be just right. You know, it just has to be like 25 degrees, cloudy, because I don't want the sun. Then I'll go soul winning. And it's like, we don't want to be Goldilocks Christians, right? We, we go, you know, it's not that hard to go soul winning when it's raining. You just take an umbrella, and most houses have a Porsche. You're just using it from house to house. It's not that big a deal. And in fact, more people are generally home when it's cold and when it's raining and things like that. Generally, like when it's hot, everyone's at the beach, everyone's out, you know, and the weather's good. Oftentimes, the best time to go soul winning is when everyone's at home, right? But everyone always has excuses, right? There's always reasons why, you know, instead of using excuses to say, why not to go? Find reasons to do something. Man, people are going to hell. And we need to preach the gospel to people. We need, you know, I need to serve. I don't want to waste my life. Come up with reasons to do something rather than excuses why not to do something. So here it's talking about, ah, you know, the slug is so lazy. He doesn't want to get out and work because it's too cold. Right? Therefore, when it, the harvest time comes, right, and you can think of this spiritually as well with, with him working for God, hey, when the rewards are doled out, you will have nothing given out. And same with the slugger. You want to work <clears throat> when the work is there, planning forward, working in the winter so that you have, you know, something at other times, you know, preparing, <coughs> and he's not ready, right? He's not ready for the time of harvest. Proverbs 19.15. And you can see here, these are all in Proverbs. Right? Slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. Right? People that are working, they suffer hunger. Why? Because they don't have enough, they're not producing enough. But look at what it says here in the first half. It's interesting. Slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep. Now, I know all of us, I mean, me included, you know, on your iPhone, you have like multiple alarms, right? It's just like snooze, snooze, snooze. But the reality of it is, right, and even though I know this, and I'm preaching to myself too, right, even though I know this, you know, if you just get up on that first alarm, you have so much more energy, right? The more you sleep, you actually get more tired, right? And same with slothfulness. What does it say? Slothfulness casts us into a deep sleep. You know, actually, the lazier you are, the less energy you have. That's why people, when they exercise, they realize hey, that actually gives me more energy throughout the day when they exercise in the morning, get up and they do something. So when people are lazy, they think, oh, you know, I don't have the energy to do things. And you know what? If you just work hard, you actually have more energy, right? Why? Because laziness casteth into a deep sleep. Softness casteth into a deep sleep. An idle soul shall suffer hung, hung, uh, hunger. All right, let's go on. Proverbs verse 20, verse 13. Love not sleep. Love not sleep. Now you may be saying, you say, oh, I love sleeping. You know, sleeping is so great. The Bible says, hey, love not sleep. It's something we're not meant to love, lest thou come to poverty. Open thine eyes, and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. Well, You've got to get up. And the funny thing is, people love sleeping so much, and like I said, excessive sleep actually makes you more tired. But do you realize that if you slept just the standard amount of time every day, right? People say eight hours of sleep is sort of like the healthy level of sleep that you get every day. Do you realize that that is one third of the day that you spend with your eyes closed? One third of the day. One third of the day you spend sleeping. So do you realize that one-third of your life is spent sleeping? Isn't that a crazy thought? That I have such a short life, and yet one-third of it, if I just sleep eight hours a day, one-third of my life is just gone, just sleeping in a bed. Why would you want to sleep more than that? 
you know, why would you want to sleep more than just what you need to sleep? Because you're just spending your life away, not even conscious of the real world. <laughs> like, just losing your life. So, like I said, if you're just sleeping just this average amount of time, you know, the standard meat, you know, healthy time, one third of your life is gone. And if we sleep any more than that, life is too short to sleep. Right? Love, not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Open thine eyes, and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. Let's go on. So that's why I love some of these prizes. Good reminder for all of us, right? To not have these traits of the sluggard. Proverbs 10, as vinegar to the teeth, and as smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to them that send him. You know, there's a, there's a saying that goes, death by a thousand paper cuts. Right? It's just, you know, little things are just too hard. And that's why the Bible says, you know, just little by little you come to poverty. Right? Because that's what la laziness is. But these little things that the sluggard won't do, if you've ever had to manage people, like the lazy person is just, just so hard. Because they're not somebody that just doesn't show up at work. It's like they show up. They're there. Because they're doing, because the sluggard is doing the bare minimum, right? So they'll be there. They'll just make everything so hard, right? You don't want to be like the sluggard. You want to do like every little thing, just complaining, dragging your feet, making it so difficult for your boss. You know, you wonder why, you know, when promotion time comes around or pay increases come around, like, why didn't you get the promotion? Why didn't you get the pay increases? Well, your bosses and your managers, they're deciding who to promote, right? And if you make their life hard, Obviously, they're not going to want to give you a good referral. They're not going to want to help support you in your progression. As vinegar to the teeth. So if you know about acidity in your mouth, you know, that's often what wears away your teeth. That's why kids, if you feed them when they're younger, and you give them too much acidic, like juices and all that sort of stuff, and you get all these children that just have these teeth that are just all worn away like fangs, Right, because it's just too much acidity going through their mouth, right, with all those sodas and all that sort of stuff. So when I think about this, that's why I think about this death by a thousand paper cuts. It's not like the sluggard is not just doing this one big problem. It's just like small things that just like make them so difficult. Vinegar to the teeth, just slowly wearing away at you this sluggard, right? And it's smoke to the eye. Think about smoke to the eye. It's not like somebody just poking you in the eye. The smoke is just like, you know, in the camp, it's just like, ah, it's just like annoying. It just stops you from moving forward, but it's not really, you know, just completely opposing you, just making it really difficult. So is the sluggard to them that send him. So you, as a Christian, if you think, I don't want to be a sluggard, you don't want to just always do the minimum, you know, making excuses at work, right? And just making it really difficult. Every time the boss asks you to do something, ah, oh, well, it's not my job or whatever. Just, just do it, you know? Just, you're there to work, you're there to serve. Your boss, if they ask you to do something, you know, if you're just glad to do it, hey, I think that will leave a better taste in their mouth when you ask them for a favor later. So always think about that, especially at work too. Proverbs 24. I love this passage. Uh, every time I think about learning by experience. I always think of this passage. Proverbs 24, verse 30. I went by the field of the slothful. So this is Solomon reflecting as he's, you know, walking through his kingdom and he sees a field. And this is the field of the lazy person, right? The field of the slothful. And by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. So you see how even though a lazy person thinks that they can justify everything in their mind, the Bible is saying this person doesn't understand how things really work in the world, how, how things are better, right? The wisdom. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof and the stone wall thereof was broken down. So you see how like he's going past the field of the slothful, it's all overgrown and just not being maintained at all, right? Because life requires maintenance. Everything requires maintenance. And the lazy person you know, may get excited and start something, but then doesn't see it to fruition, doesn't maintain it. And like his field here, it's all grown over with thorns and nettles. And this is what Solomon sees. Look at verse 32. I love how just this reads. Then I saw 
and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instructions. You see here, he's learning from the example of the sluggard. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. So you see how he's saying here, he's walking by the field, he sees the field of the slothful, and he realizes, hey, these overgrown weeds and the wall breaking down, this didn't just happen overnight. This is the accumulation of bad habits, of being lazy and just letting it go little by little, little by little, until now you're at a place where the Bible says, you know, you bring yourself into poverty. Right? You just you realize, how did I even get here? Well, it's because of the laziness, day in and day out, not seeing things through and whatnot. And the goal setting in life is the same. You know, like, you know, you make decisions. I heard this saying, you know, you can make decisions, but your, your decisions is what makes you. Because your daily decisions is ultimately where you're going to go. And if daily you make the decision to do nothing, don't expect to go anywhere in a couple of years' time. Right? Because in a couple of years' time, unfortunately, you might be further behind than where you were before. So we want to learn from other people's experience. You, know, you don't always have to learn from your own experience. It's wiser to learn from other people's experience, like Solomon here. He can go by the field of the sun. He doesn't have to be lazy himself to know that that happens. You, know, you don't have to try drugs yourself to know that they're silly. Right? You don't have to do all these things that your friends do just because they do them. Oh, but I want to experience these things. But well, you don't need to experience to learn that they're not wise to do some of these things. You can learn by wisdom. Learn by other people's experience. By much slothfulness, the building decayeth. And through idleness of the hands, the house droppeth through. Right? Things require maintenance. You can see Ecclesiastes written by Solomon. Proverbs 13, 4. The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Right? So, no, no want of desire in the sluggard's life. Yeah, they want everything, right? And in fact, they, they want it so quick that they're willing to take out credit cards and whatnot at like 15, 17% interest just to get that thing rather than just working first and earning the money and then going and buying what you can afford, right? That you've actually worked for. But the soul of the sluggard desireth and had nothing. The soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Those who actually work. I mean, people that work, they're always going to be able to make a living, right? They're always going to be fruitful in their life, both physically and if they serve the Lord spiritually. Proverbs 21, 25, the desire of the sloth will kill it then. For his hands refuse to labor. He covereth greedily all the day long. But the righteous giveth and spareth not. Right? So it's just saying righteous people, they have things to give of abundance. Right? So they can be generous when they work hard. But a lazy person can't be generous. They just want all the time because they don't have, they're not working hard to just get it themselves. Right? Proverbs 12, verse 24, The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. So I talked a bit about like la you know, laziness of people wanting something before they can afford it, and they go out and take out these outrageous loans, right? And they end up becoming a slave to the bank. Because if you have any idea how compounding interest works, compounding interest is interest earned on interest, and it's an exponential effect, right? It's good for investing. It's good that you earn money that way. But if you're taking out debt on interest, that compounding exponential effect is actually working against you. And this is why people that take out loans and they don't have the mindset to actually work hard and work it off and have mo enough money, live within their means, they end up becoming a slave to the banks. Because right? you're constantly now just working to, to service those debts and service those loans and pay the interest. You don't even have freedom anymore. Right? So here... And of the diligent shall bear all, but the slothful shall be under tribute. You know, those that work hard and are diligent are normally those that are put in charge. But you don't put a lazy person in charge of things. You put those that are diligent in charge of things. But notice here how the slothful shall be under tribute. They're going to be taxed. Why? Think about even in our society today. Everyone wants their entitlements. You know, you want to be paid to have a baby. 
You want to be paid when you're sick. You want to pay all these leave entitlements. And a lot of you know, businesses may do, you know, work it into your contract, right? But oftentimes businesses do it because they're forced to, right? Because now it's all, all the employees that are in the voter base are saying, I want this and this and this, and they're going to pay you superannuation. And, and those people that run a business, they realize that these things can be prohibitive just to like, get your business off the ground. It's so expensive to hire somebody to help you because of all these things. And then all the taxes we have to pay. Why do we have to take? You know, have you ever looked on the back of your tax return? And the first, I think the first item is like defense. And then the second item is like me medical expenses. And then the third one is like welfare. Right? So it's like all these taxes that we're paying is just to pay for people oftentimes that are not working. Because you know, all these government systems are so fraught with fraud. Do you know what I mean? They're just fraud. You know, they, they, they sell it like, oh, we're going to help these people, right? And then what actually happens when it's a government-run charity, the government shouldn't be running charity. Right? Charity should be run by churches and organizations where they're dealing with the people because the closer the money is to the person that's getting the money, the more accountability there is. You have some bureaucrat in, in Canberra deciding who's going to get this payout, these COVID payouts, and then you have businesses just rotting the system, right? That's what happens. And then we've got to pay all these taxes to pay for people that are lazy. This is what happens. The slothful shall be under tribute. So, you know, we want to get away and teach the next generations, don't have this entitlement mentality. Don't expect the government to get you your leave pay and your sick pay and all this stuff. Because, you know, the more you get the government to do stuff, there's the government premium on top of it. Because there's the, the bureaucracy and all the departments we all have to pay for to run that program. Right? So it's expensive, and, you, and, you, and you're paying for it in taxes. Right? So it's not free. Nothing is ever free. The reason why governments do things is because they take money from the population. They're just redistributing it. So that's why when you hear on the news, oh, you know, uh, what's his name? Scott Morrison created 10,000 jobs. Baloney, right? Because he just redirected the funds from the private sector into giving it government jobs, right? You know, if you start a, a useless government department and then give a bunch of people a bunch of jobs, you know, you can give people a bunch of jobs like digging holes and then filling the holes back in again. But if you're not actually producing anything, what's, what's the point of giving them a job, right? You need jobs in a society that actually produce more. Anyway, that's a, that's a whole nother topic. I won't get into that. That's one of my bugbears, sorry. That stuff. Probably, okay, Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Like I said, you don't put lazy people in charge of things. And it's the same when it comes to spiritual things as well. You know, one day when we enter into eternity, or even when we go into the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign of Christ, there will be rewards doled out. Right? And it's going to be based on how hard you work for the Lord. Not all of us are going to be equal in authority in that world. Right? So here we have the parable of the talents. And I'll just read the last bit. We see here that the man that did nothing with his talent, right, was not even, not, not even wanted to, like the Bible talked about, had a hand in the bosom, not even want to bring it to his mouth. This man did not even want to put the money into the bank and get what was free. And I think that represents salvation, right? He didn't even want to take the, God, God had given him, like the faith, put it on the Lord Jesus Christ and get what was free, right? The usury. He didn't even do that. This is why I think the parable talks about him being cast out into, with his weeping and gnashing of teeth. But look at what it says here in verse 24. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid. So like, you know, the, the lazy person always has a justification in his mind, right? Like he's trying to justify here why he did nothing with the talent. And I was afraid. I was a lion in the streets. And when and hid thy talent in the earth, lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, look at this, thou wicked and slothful servant, lazy. Thou knewest where I reap, where I sowed not, and gathered where I, had, where I, uh, where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchanges, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath Ten talents, for unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance, but from him that hath not shall be taken away, even that which he hath. Now people strive so hard in this world to have power and influence and significance, 
And you know what? I would rather spend my life serving the Lord because for all eternity, we're going to have the reward of ruling and reigning with the Lord Jesus Christ. But not everyone will. Right? Not everyone, or well, first of all, is saved. Not every saved person will be given authority over cities, right? Because it depends on what you do for the Lord. Proverbs 18, verse 9. He also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster. He also that is slothful in his work, so a lazy person, is a brother, is, has, a, has a similarity to somebody who's a great waster. Now, why is there a link between being slothful and lazy and being wasteful? Why? Because it's a lot harder, it's harder, more hard work to maintain things and keep things clean. It's really easy to just throw things out and buy it again, isn't it? So that's why slothful people waste a lot. Not only do they not appreciate the work and time that's gone into something, right? But it's just easier just to throw it out and do it again, right? What? So you just waste money. How many times have you seen people that, you know, when they're lazy and they don't take the time to like be organized and then what happens, right? They didn't do the diligence to be organized. Now you got to do everything last minute. Now you got to pay express posts. Now you got to pay like, uh, you know, the, the company to do it like express for you, right? Do everything faster. I got to get, I got to go get my passport. Right now, I got to pay the express fee. You know, I ran out of toilet paper. Now I got to go down to the 7-Eleven and pay like ten dollars for a pack of six. So it's just like a great waster, right? You know, rather than you know preparing your lunch and being diligent, oh, just you know buy this, buy that. You know, rather than going to the shops and buying like a box of drinks or whatever, oh, I'll just go to the servo. Just three dollars, right? all that money is going. It's wasting the Lord's money just because you're not diligent lazy, right? It's not organized and prepared. So that's why somebody who's lazy often will waste a lot of things as well. <clears throat> Proverbs 12, 27, the slothful man roasteth not that which he took in hunting, but the substance of a diligent man is precious. So it's kind of linked to the fact that a lazy person is a great waste because they don't work for it. They don't appreciate it. That's why you give people just like handouts. They don't appreciate that money. They go and just spend it and just waste it because they never did anything to earn that money. But you know, when you get somebody working and they earn that money and the money they got wasn't free. You know how the Bible says, uh, not the Bible, you know the saying, free has no value. When you get something for free, you don't value it, right? You have to work a little bit for it. Then you value it because you have to put some effort in to get this. This is what this, this, what this verse is saying. It's saying the substance of a diligent man is precious. He realizes the work it took to create this productivity. You just give it away to lazy people. He says just, the sloth, see the slothful man? He's eating what he didn't even get, what he didn't even work to earn. And this is why the Bible, you say, uh, you know, in Thessalonians, when the Bible talks about dealing with a lazy person in church, it says, hey, don't even let them eat. You know, like, don't even fellowship with that person. When you see how much God has to say about being slothful, you can see why it's a, it's a serious thing. Right? And we're not talking about people that are you know, disabled or unable to work and, and that sort of thing, uh, have health challenges. I'm talking about people that are able-bodied and lazy. They're able to work and they're not. So the substance of a diligent man is precious. Right? He, he appreciates his material possessions because he worked for it. But, you know, lazy people, they think everything should be free. Lazy people want the government to pay for everything. They want government to pay for their education and all health care and all this sort of stuff. You know, these things should not be paid for by the government. These, should, these things should be just paid for by, you know, the people's productivity and whatnot. Charity is a different thing. Charity is where people can help out, but then that's not the government's job. Lazy people want something for nothing. Lazy people complain but not willing to be part of the solution. That often, how often happens a lot, right? Where people complain about how things are, but they don't want to do anything to fix it. That's a lazy person. They don't want to be part of actually fixing the problem. You know, if you can't bring solutions, you've got to sometimes hold back your criticisms, right? You know, sometimes, sometimes people, it's always good sometimes to give feedback, but if you, you should be more sparing with your criticism if you're not doing anything to fix the problem. But I think if people do something 
and be part of the solution, then I think that gives them the right to be a bit more critical about how things are, right? Because they're actually doing it. Now they're actually involved. Proverbs 6. This is the second last passage I'm going to. Proverbs 6. <laughs> Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Go to the... So it's interesting that the, the ant, so the sluggard, the slug, is the animal that represents a lazy person. <laughs> It's interesting that God uses these sort of visuals for us, right? Like in Job, where he says, look at Behemoth, look at Leviathan. And here he's saying, if you want to see, if you want a good example from the animal kingdom of a hard-working person, look at an ant, right? Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide or overseer or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. You see how our ants just work. They just work. They don't need to be supervised. And I'm sure if you've got an ant problem at your house, like I do, you know, like ants come into the kitchen, those little scout ants, they don't need somebody like just telling them what to do. They're just out doing their job, right? Not even supervised. They're, they're so efficient that they're, you know, the scout ants go everywhere looking for this stuff, right? So this is how we want to be as a Christian, we want to be like the ant that just goes about their thing. And just think about the ant colony, right? Where the ants, they're just busy. They don't complain. It's like, it's like in that, that, that kids show, you know, ants, where like, they're just born and they're just like given their role, right? Worker, whatever. Okay? Uh, so it's a bit like that. I mean, they don't complain. They're just given the task and that's just where they work in the colony. And then you think about what ants accomplish. Have you seen those documentaries on ants where they just make these huge colonies? And like, just imagine, like, if God's people were like that. If God's people were like ants, imagine the things we could accomplish if everyone just put their hand to the plow and just worked and just did their job, didn't complain. Like, imagine the things we would accomplish. Right? And I always say this about soul winning as well. Like, you say, you know, we're taking so long to like knock this area. If we just had double the amount of people we had. If we went from four people every week to eight people every week, it would just double how much we could reach. Then we went from eight people to 16 people. It would just double again how many we're going to reach. You don't need a ton of people to just reach an area and re-knock and just be really effective in an area. But, you know, the harvest is plenteous. The laborers are few. So you can see here that the ant goes about, doesn't need supervision, Forward thinking, preparing for when, you know, they're organized, right? This is, this is a verse about being organized. You provide a meat in the summer, gathereth the food and harvest. So you work hard, you pre-planning and pre-organizing for when there might be a lull in food or in work or whatnot. Now look at this in verse 9. How long will thou sleep, O sluggard? <coughs> When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Verse 10. Yet a little sleep. Doesn't this sound familiar? Like the field of the slothful. A little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy want as an armed man. So be careful of slothfulness. Be careful, be careful of laziness. And it's not just the energy level. Slothfulness generally manifests itself in your life as, I'll do it tomorrow. The procrastination, right? I'll do it later. Every day is, ah, I'll do it later. Ah, today's been a hard day. Take a seat in the easy chair. Turn on, you know, the TV. You just veg out. You know, I, I, I woke up early this morning. I worked. I worked my... You know, seven and a half, uh, you know, seven hours, 29 minutes with like one hour and a half lunch break instead of an hour break, you know. <laughs> That's how it manifests itself. And it's just uh, the daily putting it off, just waste your life and then you get nothing done, right? That's why. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy want as an odd man. Now, in conclusion, I just want to tell you something a bit ironic I find about laziness, about slothfulness. So we want to work hard, right? We want to be diligent, be organized, we plan ahead, remove vain activities from our life. We want to schedule 
you know, the small tasks in the day because they're going to add up to larger accomplishments in our life. We, we stay busy so we don't just wasting to have an idle time or we're just reducing, we want to reduce procrastination. You know, do your part in life and in God's kingdom. You know, take initiative, don't oversleep, stop making excuses. Look what the Bible says here in uh, Proverbs 15, 19. This is the irony. Proverbs 15, 19. The way of the slothful man is as a hedge of thorns, but the way of the righteous is made plain. So even though we talk about like slothfulness and we talk the opposite is like working hard and you think like, that's ah, like a harder life, like working hard, being diligent, and getting up and everything like that. But yet the Bible says in Proverbs 15, 19, the way of the slothful man is a hedge of thorns. It's actually more difficult, more dangerous. You're more likely to get hurt in the way of a slothful man. But the way of the righteous is actually the easier path. The diligent man, the way is made plain. So isn't that interesting that you think, well, I'll not be slothful, I work harder. But actually, if you are diligent, if you are organized, if you work a little bit harder just in you know, planning and your life will actually be way easier. Isn't that interesting? So that's why I just find it a little bit, it's like, it's like a bit of an irony that in order to make your life easier, you work harder, and that actually makes your life easier. You know? Because lazy people, their lives hard, they come across with problems, more problems, right? Because they don't deal with the problem and then they become bigger problems, right? So this, this is like what I want you to go away with is, you know what, if you're actually a bit more organized, if you work a bit harder, your life will actually be a lot easier, you'll be more productive, you'll do good things, greater things for the Lord. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your words this morning as we read through a lot of the Proverbs. Thank you that there's so much that's said about not only laziness, but a lot of other topics in life as well. Thank you for this reminder, Lord, this morning. <coughs> Help us to not be slothful, a slothful sluggard. Uh, help us to be wise and diligent. And uh, we need your grace, Lord. It's so easy sometimes to just be lazy, but Lord, help us to know that if we just take the easy road day in and day out, our life is actually going to be a lot harder down the road. So Lord, help us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.